Grand Portage National Monument is located in the northeastern portion of Minnesota. There is a partially reconstructed stockade area that appears as it did in the 1790s when it was the Northwest Company's fur trading headquarters on Lake Superior's western shore. There is also an eight and a half mile Portage Trail that was a vital link of one of the principal routes for Native Americans, explorers, missionaries, and fur trappers heading for the Northwest. It was part of the ancient Grand Portage Trail, which had been used for centuries before the fur traders arrived. To 1803, the most profitable fur trade operation on the Great Lakes was here. Sixteen wooden buildings stood inside the palisade, including a business office, warehouse for trade goods and furs, food storage buildings, and living quarters for the partners and clerks. Note, not the traders. French Canadian voyagers and British partners carried on a profitable fur trade for over a century. So every other year we build the canoe here, so that would be on the even years. Uh huh. And this is the work in progress that we're building this this is going to be a ricing canoe it's uh, so the design is specifically to harvest wild rice and you can't tell it right now but with all the rocks down here it's um, it has a very flat broad bottom okay. and you would push it through the rice bog with a pole like a like in Venice of the gondola yeah and then you'd have ricing sticks where you would go like one over and one under and tip the stalks into the canoe and the rice that was ready to harvest would fall off into the bottom of your canoe. You know, basically three kinds of trees and there's the birch bark, which is the outside. Yeah. And then the gunnel and the ribs are made of cedar. Uh-huh. And then it's sewn together, the birch panels and where it's all tied together here, that's black spruce root. And all three of those kinds of trees are indigenous to this area. Okay. And if you go 100 miles in any direction, you can maybe find two of them or one of them. But this is like the only place for a long, a long ways where all three of those trees uh -huh. um, are native. One of the the band members brings his fish. Oh. I think he brought brought that yesterday. And that's Lake Heron. It's for shade, uh, for holding down a piece of wood. So if you were making a rib for one of those that canoe down there, or say a barrel stay. Some canoes were 25 feet long and carried four to six voyagers. Lake canoes about 10 feet longer carried twice as many Montreal men and up to 8,000 pounds of cargo. Uh, the hard part's making this the actual structure of the boat is these gunnels formed in two pieces. Uh, the bark is stitched between them and all these other pieces are just pressed into place. So the bark is actually holding all the pressure of this load, which is pretty impressive. Uh, eighth of an inch thick. Uh, the bark there is another sixteenth. Uh, 
uh, thick. Uh, this, this part, this boat does 30 portages between here and Montreal. North Canoe does 33 portages between here and Rainy Lake. Birch bark is the only bark that has its grain that goes around the tree. Okay. So you peel it and it just tears off along these lenticels. You don't need to gurgle the tree. You got your birch bark. Uh, you then take your awl and it's sharp. It's not pointy. You're not poking a hole. It's sharp. You're grinding the hole through. So you grind all these holes. You take the black spruce root, uh, which you find in the bogs, and you uh, strip the bark off and you split it and you sew it together. That's the bark the tree makes. It doesn't die. It makes this other bark. Uh, looks almost like a maple tree. Mm -hmm. So you never use it again for a boat, but you can make um, baskets out of it. You make very nice baskets. Uh, you then punched holes all through your boat, so you have the uh, spruce gum, which is the tree's been damaged. It oozes out the sap and it hardens. Yeah. You melt it. Uh, you add charcoal from the fire to make it black. And then you add uh, bear grease. Bear grease? Bear, first kill bear, uh, gather his fat, what? render the fat down. Oh, oh it's actually, you really. I can't smell. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and you adjust the, the mixtures for operating temperature. Very dry boat. Uh, every package has a number. Uh, every man is assigned one of those, pa actually, he's assigned eight of those packages. Consumables, so tobacco, 70% uh, of the trade was fabric, which is consumed, uh, cordage for making nets and things, uh, tobacco uh, that you smoke, uh, so. uh, but it was a real problem once you have these people equipped. Why do they need to bring you any more beavers? During the company's heyday, all trade goods going to outposts in the Canadian fur country and all furs bound for Montreal were funneled through Grand Portage. The Cedar Picket Palisade was designed mainly as secure storage for extensive inventories of goods rather than as defense against attack. When those guys would arrive here, of course, after living off of peas and corn for about six to seven weeks, <laughs> we will give them peas and corn. It won't change for those guys. And they'll be outside the walls preparing their own food. No room in here with 16 buildings. The kitchen was basically the sole territory of the owners of the company. So when the owners would arrive from London and Montreal every summer, um, and from Scotland, they're going to show up with one to three personal servants. They're going to show up with their own uh, clerks and secretaries. And a professional chef would be here in place. Now that chef knows there's no game left in this area by 1790 from the thousands of people involved in the fur trade. So we're going to bring in livestock from Sault Ste. Marie. So the sheep, chickens, pigs, goats, oxen, and cows will arrive on the company's schooner and the rest of the food coming in from farms as far away as Detroit, Niagara, and Montreal. So it's just basically a private kitchen for the owners. Do you have something in the uh, Dutch oven? Yeah, I'm making a, a standing crust, kind of like a bread bowl. Oh! Uh, so that'll be, uh, we'll be making a uh, barley and moose stew tomorrow. In here, barley so. and moose stew beginnings. So I'm kind oh. of pre-baking the, the bowl that will go inside. This is the Great Hall, which came to life as fur traders converged in late June for rendezvous. Company partners, clerks, and Indians talked business in the Great Hall by day and dined in the evening. Food was repair, prepared in the kitchen behind the Great Hall. I would have been a clerk for the Northwest Company. Um, 
The uh, clerks would have been at these other tables here. They would have kept uh, the inventories uh, of the furs and would have inspected uh, the trade goods here. Um, uh, the trade goods coming all the way from around the world as far as Italy or uh, Brazil or things like that, going all the way into the Canadian interior. Uh, this is Nutria. <laughs> this is a relative of the beaver. Um, but they would have preferred the beaver. The beaver was the prime pelt. Um, and the beaver is unique in that it has these, these two layers of furs here to help keep it nice and warm. Mm. Uh, peg like this and you would pluck the bow and it would kind of fluff the fibers. The whole reason that the Northwest Company was in this region and all the way in far northern parts of Canada as far as the Pacific Coast, the whole reason was the beaver felt hat. And when no one wanted a beaver felt hat anymore, the whole fur industry essentially collapsed. Oh, that was more my Yeah, style. that matches your clothes. Yeah. Yeah. Three, after the Northwest Company relocated northward to avoid the complications of citizenship, licensing, and import duties. Voyagers carried two 90-pound packs along the eight-and-a-half-mile portage between Lake Superior and Fort Charlotte, the company's smaller storage depot on the Pigeon River. Today, the Grand Portage Trail is open year-round to hikers and backpackers and cross-country skiers.